Hello, everybody. Um, my name's Yara, and welcome to Anti Capitalist Movements from the Global South with me um, and Vincent Bevins and uh, Vijay Prashad. Um, I'm obviously not James Butler, he couldn't be here, um, unfortunately. Uh, so I'm going to be running the session. Um, I'm an author and uh, yeah, today was um, researching Brazilian communists in the library, so this is a perfect ending. Um, before I introduce our speakers and we kick off, I'm just gonna start with a couple of gen um, general rules and housekeeping type stuff. So um, engaging, uh, we want everyone to feel welcome in these spaces and um, for everyone's voices to be heard. So please bear this in mind when you're engaging in the chat or in the comment boxes, which you should be able to see. Um, so don't use inappropriate language, rude, don't be unkind, um, and please don't spam either. Um, sort of like basic common sense stuff. Participants who violate these principles may be prevented from further posting in the chat box. Uh, hopefully this won't happen. Um, and we will be watching to see like your questions. So if you put them there, um, we'll be picking those up later. Um, so we're also using something called Otter. Um, it's a live transcription service. Attendees using Otter will have to follow a link and open a transcript in a separate window. Uh, the link will be shared in the chat box by a tech volunteer. If you're having difficulties, please message the tech volunteer in the chat and they'll help make sure that works for you. And last of all, um, The World Transformed is free for everyone, but it's only made possible by the contributions of our supporters. So if you're able to and you can afford, um, please consider supporting us at theworldtransform.org forward slash support. Um, and you can make sure that the work can keep going all year round. Um, so that's that. Um, I'm going to introduce our panelists and then uh, they'll each have 15 minutes to uh, give their kind of opening remarks and then we'll open up to questions. Um, so we've got uh, Vijay Prashad, who's the director of the Tricontinental Institute and the chief editor of Left Word Books, and Vincent Bevins, author and journalist, um, and yeah, author of the Jakarta Method, um, which has been like really exploding and doing really well. So I'm very excited to be here, um, and also particularly excited because Vincent is joining us off a BlackBerry, um, a proper uh, throwback. So. Um, yeah, take it away, Vincent. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. So hopefully this is working out okay. My my camera at the last moment um, didn't work out, but that's fine. I'm holding the phone up into my face in in my room. So first, I want to thank everyone uh, for inviting me and for anybody that's tuning in. Um, so this is a forum on anti-capitalist movements in the global south. And I am, of course, a journalist from the United States that works primarily in, uh, I really set this up. Hold on, let me set this light up really, right? Um, sorry about that. Right, so I am not a member or participant in, in, in anti-capitalist movements from the global south. I'm a journalist that works in mainstream corporate media. But what I've been working on recently is studies of the ways that my government has crushed um, left-wing movements in the global south and working on ways, the ways in which those movements have been represented in English language media worldwide. So I, I think I was asked on this panel because I wrote a book called The Jakarta Method, which is about anti-communist mass murder in uh, the 20th century. And so I'll probably stick to analytical um, interventions and leave it to Vijay, who has a lot more experience actually active in, in anti-capitalist movements in the global south, where I'm just a journalist from America. So what I want to do is really quickly summarize the, the main points in the Jakarta Method, and then add two new points, which might be relevant to the moment we're living through right now. So the Jakarta Method as a book reveals the extent to which we live in a world that was created by the violent deletion of socialist movements from world history, right? So these movements, especially in the global South, suffered regime change, economic terrorism, 
or in the most extreme cases, the outright employment of mass murder of innocent civilians. And the, the, the last tactic, the intentional mass murder of people for being leftist or for being accused of being leftists, um, is what I call the Jakarta method. And, and that is because after the US and UK backed intentional mass murder of approximately 1 million people in 1965 in Indonesia, other right-wing move movements around the world, allies of the United States, potential allies of the United States, um, employed the word Jakarta to sign signify the plan that inspired them, something that they were going to do to their own leftists, whether in Chile or Brazil, they spoke of Plan Jakarta, Operação Jakarta in Brazil, and Central America, we saw um, also the discussion of employing Plan Jakarta to quite little, literally decimate leftist movements in those countries. Um, and of course, as we know all too well, they did, right? Um, I found in my work then that in at least 20 countries backed by the United States, um, the intentional mass murder of leftists or people accused of, use, of being leftist was used in the construction of authoritarian capitalist regimes. So this is an important distinction. Um, this wasn't violence that was, was done out of sort of uh, rage or wanton revenge. It was violence that was important to constructing the, war, the order that we live in now. And so the scars of this anti-communist violence, this violence employed against the left, are very much with us uh, in many countries around the world, most notably probably Indonesia and Brazil, two countries that I know fairly well. Um, in Indonesia, it is still actually illegal to speak of what really happened in 1965. And in Brazil now is, of course, run by somebody who was dedicated to the full resurrection of the ideology that powered anti-communist mass murder in the 20th century, Jair Bolsonaro. And I spent, you know, I'm now back in London, but I spent most of the beginning of this year in um, Sao Paulo feeling just like the rest of the country, very, uh, very concretely and physically what that means. But the violent deletion, the mass cancellation, you might say, of left-wing movements in the global south in the 20th century has more profound, uh, had more profound uh, effects on the shape of the entire world. Um, uh, it, it affected the shape of the type of globalization that we got in the 21st century. And this is the world we live in now. So in the first years after World War II, newly independent post-colonial countries, uh, particularly in Africa and Asia, had leaders that thought it was self-evident that their countries would take the rightful place alongside the rich countries of Western Europe and um, North America, the so-called first world, um, alongside the countries allied with Moscow, the so-called second world, and that they would, as a new mass of humanity um, that is the majority of planet Earth, um, newly liberated and finally in possession of their own destinies, they saw it as obvious that they would be able to reshape the global order according to their own um, you know, wishes and take the rightful place alongside the first and second world. Now, this was the the, the thrust of the so-called third world movement, right? An entirely optimistic and forward-looking movement um, powered in the global south that um, would also um, quite uh, quite often was led by people who believed that just as 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 um, automatically that it would be natural that the world that they would um, take part in creating after the fall of formal uh, colonialism between uh, the first world and the third, that this new world would be more socialist if, 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 if uh, or at least a softer version of capitalism. Now, of course, in 2020, this is not the world that we occupy, right? And as I got to know so many of the people that were involved in the Indonesian left, the Brazilian left, the Chilean left, the the, the, the so-called Bandung movement in 1955 to 1963-4, what was most striking about speaking to them was, was the extent to which the world that they believed would be here now is not, and how tragically it was for them to think about that lost possibility even more so than the, the horrible violence that they or, or their friends and family experienced. So, um, but we don't live in that world, right? We live in a we, we live in a world in which the Americanization of the global economy is more or less, was more or less complete at the end of the 20th century. Um, we 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 uh, inherited a world in which um, capitalist uh, a, a global capitalist order led by Washington maintained more or less in the broadest strokes 
the relationship between the first and third world, third world that existed in the era of formal colonialism. So Sukarno, the first president of Indonesia would have called this neo-colonialism. Um, he called that, that's what he called it back in 1965. And I'm sure that's the word that he would use to describe the global economy in 2020. So, um, so but the Cold War ended, right? The United States, uh, the, the Soviet Union fell apart. Um, and you know, the, 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 the formerly communist countries of Central Eastern Europe broke into a kind of oligarchic capitalism, but the United States did not fall apart. Uh, and the institutions in, in the US and the UK and in Western Europe that were created to and employed to crush socialism in the global South, or at the very least to take out perceived threats to the United States and the West as, as the, the officials in those countries perceived them, they still exist. All of those, none of that fell apart at the end of the Cold War, right? Um, and the, 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 the tool book that they accumulated throughout the Cold War is still there too, right? Um, and the, the, the one thing that I really tried to make clear after doing this research for the, the Jakarta method, which I'll stop talking about in a bit, was that these movements, these global right-wing movements learned from each other. They, they built up a base of knowledge. They, they, they discovered which things worked. They traded secrets. They, they transferred actual men and women across the world who would be, who carried um, new techniques. Um, between nations, and they employed them um, increasingly effectively. And this, and like, and, and this toolbox, as I said, is still with us. Um, so that brings me to the two points about 2020 and 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 the the new things, the new the new points that I would might like to make in addition to the Jakarta, which I've, the charting method, which I've talked about quite a bit. Um, that and and as I said, I'm a journalist, so these are both these are both about the these are both at the level of mainstream commentary and journalism and political discourse in the US and Western Europe. And the first is that I believe that in English language mainstream discourse, we do not have a full enough understanding of regime change. Uh, we do not have a kind of theoretical approach to the kinds of ways, to, to, to the kinds of um, processes that lead one government to lead to another, to the kinds of coups that happen uh, in the global south, the kinds of the ways in which a certain type of government can be replaced with another type of government. For some reason, these dozens and dozens and dozens of U.S.-backed coups, coups that crush the left, or uh, the the long sort of sort of painful bleeding out of governments, or as I said, the the employment of of mass murder. Um, all of these dozens and dozens of cases are seem to be so pushed so far back into our collective. Uh, memory hole or marginalized so much from the center of the narrative that we fail to off uh, we all too often fail to recognize the very obvious commonalities between the things that are happening right in front of our eyes and one of the and, and this and this is this is one of the things that Vijay's new books Washington Bullets does so well and it's such an important task to sort of build up a narrative about the script that exists these are the things that usually happen before this happens and this is what to look for when regime change of the type uh, that we're so used to seeing, uh, if we pay attention to the history of uh, left-wing movements in the global south, um, this, is, the, the, this is a body of knowledge that we have almost intentionally uh, removed um, from our, our own toolbox. And I think the most obvious example of, of this in the last year is Bolivia, right? So at the end of last year, when Evo Morales fled the country after the military told him he had to end his mandate before his uh, before it was up you had people that are apparently responsible and thoughtful commentators in the liberal english language press saying things that would be impossible to say if they had even sort of scanned the wikipedia of regime change in latin america saying outrageous things like well it can't be a coup because some people in bolivia wanted it to happen and because uh, or it can't be a coup because morales lost some of his support or made mccase or made mistakes or it can't be a coup because some people in the international liberal media think it's good for Bolivia. Um, if those three things made it not a coup, there has never been a coup in the history of Latin America. But the people that, wrote, that were writing about these things at the end of 2019 were so unfamiliar with a, constant, <laughs> a constantly unfolding process in Latin America and the Global South that they failed to make the obvious connections. I think partially, I mean, who knows what the, if, it's, if it was more ignorance or more cynicism, but. Um, 
we need to start to think about regime change as a category of, of, of processes and, and develop sort of a, a theoretical approach or even just a, just a recognition that this is a, a type of thing that happens. And the second thing is I think that in mainstream English language discourse, we have a really insufficient understanding of white terror. Now, we know all too well the stories of uh, left-wing regimes or collectivist regimes that have employed at violence in, in, in the pursuit of their goal. We hear these very often in the English speaking world. We have a very immature understanding of the fact that when the most powerful people in society have their privileges threatened or perceive that they have their privileges threatened, they can often react much more violently or much more radically um, than, than uh, 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 anybody expects. And, and they often have the tools uh, at their disposal to be quite effective to, to deploy institutional uh, power or violence against those that they believe to be a threat. And this doesn't have to be just rounding up hundreds of thousands of people um, and killing them and throwing them into rivers, as we saw in Indonesia, or it doesn't have to be the white terror that we saw in South Korea before the Korean War or in Taiwan, um, just after Chiang Kai-shek took over that island. You can also consider, you know, th 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 this process to be at work in the kinds of things like the purge of a left-wing political party, the purge of, a, of the left from a political party. Or when, uh, for example, a group of oligarchs get together to shut down in, uh, media operations. Um, now, those things might be might be resonant to people living in the first world in the in the, in the rich, formerly imperialist uh, north. Um, but I think they're at work throughout the world, and I think that those two those two things that we understand insufficiently, regime change and white terror employed with the blessing or active participation of local elites um, really played a key role in violently removing um, socialism from the, the, the fabric of politics in the global South. And we, and that's important to understanding that. Um, and the, the final question is whether or not um, changes in the nature of the global system right now allow for its reinsertion, allow, allow for um, a very different set of, of dynamics to be at work between the first and third world, which is, I think, an open question. So yeah, so so thank you. Thank you so much, Vincent. Um, yeah, brilliant. Um, BJ, off you go. Okay, here we go. Uh, first, thanks a lot to Vincent. Thanks, Yara, for uh, for hosting us. Thanks to Vincent for um, those comments. Just want to say, Vincent, that a book I had written a few years ago, Red Star with the Third World, has just been published in Indonesian by an extremely brave publisher, Margin Kirill. It's an act of extraordinary courage, I think, for them to publish a book like this um, in Indonesia. So it's Red Star over the Third World. In, uh, in Indonesian. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to release, I'm not doing like a whole series of announcements by the way, but these are all uh, appropriate. Tomorrow I'm going to release this book. I only have a cover as a piece of paper. It's called Washington Bullets. It'll be out in Spanish tomorrow. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about the book, uh, which Vincent mentioned. Um, last year, as Vincent said, there was a coup against our brother Evo Morales Aima of Bolivia. Uh, the legitimate president of Bolivia. Um, when the coup happened, honestly, I was, I mean, I'm not a naive person. I better start my time, otherwise I'm going to go on and on. Uh, I'm not a naive person, but I was quite shocked by the reaction, not only of like, you know, the New York Times and the, the garbage media, not only their reaction, because one expected them to line up behind the United States State Department. In many ways, that entire group of media are stenographers of, um, you know, of the Pompeos of the world. You know, they might sniff a little bit when Mike Pompeo is speaking because he's a little vulgar for them. But they basically agree, agree with the Pompeo-Trump approach to Venezuela, to Iran, uh, to China, and so on. There's broad ruling class agreement in the United States. I wasn't surprised about that. I was actually surprised that the so-called Western left was lining up to cheer the coup against Evo Morales because they felt, well, as Vincent rightly said, they were saying things like, well, you know, he lost support and so on. As if that is a sufficient reason to overthrow somebody. After all, after the third election, Evo Morales had a mandate till January. So why was he driven out of power in November? 
His mandate didn't end until January. Now it turns out, and Manuel Bertoldi and I have written a piece about this for Globetrotter, it turns out that a number of American political scientists have looked at the election data forensically, and they've shown that there is no question of fraud in the uh, October 2019 election in Bolivia. No question that this was the organization of American states playing a very dirty game, a very dirty game, which was used by the U.S. government and the far right wing in Bolivia to put pressure on Evo Morales in the mass. Um, they used General Kaliman, who had been on a training course in the United States, to go and essentially tell Morales, time to leave. Uh, it was a coup. And I'm amazed and quite shocked that sensitive, sensible people are still unwilling to call it for what it was. You know, what the hell else was it? It was a coup d'etat against a person who had governed for 14 years. I want people to think about this. Today is the birthday of Eduardo Galeano. One of my great friends and a superb writer, great inspiration to people uh, like us. Uh, Eduardo in Open Veins of, of Latin America writes about the destruction of what becomes Bolivia from the time of the conquest out till, you know, yesterday. Uh, the destruction, you know, the, the resources taken out of their um, large indigenous population, completely set aside, marginalized, treated as labor. Uh, not treated as human beings. And then arrives Mas, then arrives Evo, then arrives that whole movement that after Cochabamba, after the gas wars, the water wars, they come to office in Bolivia and they start a process of democratizing society and mark this, democratizing the economy. When we talk about anti-capitalist movements in the global south, it's not about you know human rights and democracy, fellas. It's about democratizing the economy. And that's what Evo and Mas do in Bolivia. It's because of that that they had to get rid of Morales, because he was one of the last shining lights of governments which had been able to totally pivot and transform an economy that had been utterly treated as an imperial outpost of multinational US and Canadian companies. Let's not forget the Canadians. Over 60% of mining companies are located, are uh, based in Canada, things like Barrick Gold and so on. The Canadian and U.S. companies have treated um, Bolivia essentially as the place from which they've stripped out whatever wealth is possible and, you know, left the people behind. Well, Morales, just before the coup, was at the U.N. and he laid out a bunch of statistics, you know, showed that poverty had declined in Bolivia from about 38 percent of the population to around 15 percent that life expectancy had risen by nine full years, that because of mass, because of the struggle of the women comrades in mass, more than 50% of the people in the legislature in Bolivia were women representatives. You know, these were substantial gains for a country that had been treated so wretchedly by imperialism and colonialism. And it's a bloody irony that we live in a world where the colonial and imperial countries are the ones that come out there and they tell us what human rights are. I am unprepared to listen to the US government lecture me about human rights. I don't want Boris Johnson of all goddamn people to tell me about human rights. I don't need the French to go to Beirut and tell people about good governance and human rights. And I certainly don't want the Belgians to walk around the Congo or the Dutch to stroll around in Indonesia in their, you know, their nice cut suits talking about human rights. These people are yet to apologize for the history of colonialism and they're yet to provide adequate reparations. You know what would be a good beginning? We don't want their reparations as such unless we can seize it from them. A good beginning is if they totally cancel the $13 trillion of debt, which is going to increase during this COVID-19 pandemic and its aftermath. They don't even want to suspend debt payments. They're unwilling to do that, let alone cancel the debt. We are demanding a total cancellation of all debt. You know, there should be no question that the London Club and the Paris Club should have no rights at any table to talk about debt servicing. You know why I'm, I'm saying this to you? If I go to a casino and I put money down on, you know, Black 19 or whatever, and I my number doesn't come up, I lose the money. But the way the Paris and London clubs, these are the debt securing uh, agencies work, 
is when these Western banks and wealthy bondholders lend money to Argentina or when they lend money to Indonesia, whether the, the, the ball comes from their number or not, they get paid. And I think they have stopped, you know, being essentially penalized for taking bad decisions. It's the banks and the bondholders that don't deserve to be paid anymore. They use the fact, they use the stick they have, the military clout, the instruments of hybrid war, the instruments of coup d'etat. They use this to secure their power over the well-being of people. Our anti-capitalist movements in the global south are not able to develop, to grow, to breathe because these wealthy bondholders, governments that back them and so on, use every instrument possible, including the coup d'etat, to get their way. You know, let's be straight about this. You know, Evo Morales was not overthrown um, in November 2019 because of something that happened on the 20th of October in, in 2019 in an election. From the first day that he was elected and voted into power, the U.S. ambassador was trying to undermine Evo Morales from the first day. And we know this. We know this thanks to a very brave person, Chelsea Manning. And because Chelsea Manning was able to get those State Department cables, she handed them in to Julian Assange. Julian Assange to me is a personal hero. On the 7th of September, the British government, to its eternal shame, there are so many things the British government should be ashamed that it's done in history. But now, again, to its eternal shame, is going to open extradition hearing against to extradite Julian Assange to the United States. And I seriously hope every one of you listening is going to be out there banging the drum against the extradition of Julian Assange to the United States because they are going to put him into prison for life, if not do something worse to Julian. A brave person published what Chelsea Manning had found. And in those WikiLeaks cables, we know, we hear, we can see the U.S. ambassador from the beginning, from day one, wanting to undermine Evo Morales and the agenda of mass, which is an agenda of resource socialism. In other words, using the fruits of the resources, whatever money is gained, to turn it around to help the well-being of the people. I mean, that's what they were using the wealth of Bolivia for, for 14 years. And that's how they were able to reduce the poverty rate and so on. The government was overthrown in a coup d'etat. One of our anti-capitalist movements, they attempted to suffocate with that coup d'etat and they've killed so many of our comrades in the aftermath. Just as they've been systematically killing our comrades in Colombia, in India, across the world. I mean, the, the attack on our people, including in South Africa, the attack on Abaklali in Southern Africa, the shack dwellers movement is something that you've got to pay attention to and lift your voices in places like the United Kingdom, Europe and so on. Don't let them forget what's being done in the name of the wealthy bondholders. Well, they do all that. That's all very well. They overthrow Evo Morales. And then Janet Anias, who is the so-called president of Bolivia, has essentially suspended elections forever. There will not be elections for an entire year. And I haven't read one editorial in the Guardian, so-called liberal media, New York Times, not one editorial condemning the government of Bolivia for running a government for an entire year without an election. They supported the coup against Evo, saying it was an undemocratic election. For God's sake, that was an election. She has never had an election. And I haven't seen you once sniff your nose at that. Human Rights Watch. You know, Ken Roth has been the head of Human Rights Watch as long as the dictator Mubarak headed Egypt. He is very happy to attack Venezuela in a recent report. They're very happy to attack every country that the United States doesn't like. Countries that the United States likes, like Ivan Duque's Colombia, I don't see them taking a strong position against what the government in Colombia is, you know, not only allowing happen, but in many cases is suggesting to people to do, which is to kill social movement leaders like Patron, recently killed just a few weeks ago. You know, what we see in India, the total calamity, these governments unable to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, meanwhile, the Chinese government has swiftly broken the chain of infection. Laos, we have a socialist government. Infection is gone, you know, almost go gone in, in Vietnam. The government using science, not a hallucinatory approach to COVID-19, but science 
using the public sector, using public action and internationalism has been fighting to tackle um, you know, this pandemic. I mean, the last example I'm going to give you is Cuba. Cuba, you know, extraordinary, the Cubans, despite for almost 70 years facing direct attack from the imperialists, our Cuban comrades, 11 million people have held their heads up and said, as, as Fidel Castro said in 1953, once a people win something, they will not give it up easily. 29,000 medical students walked out of their dormitories in Cuba and tested every one of the 11 million Cuban who, people living in Cuba. They tested everybody. They are taking care of their people. You know, these small socialist experiments like we see in Cuba or we see in our many movements around the world, we are committed to the well-being of the people of the world. These other characters, these Bolsonaro's, these Narendra Modi's, these Donald Trump's, these people are principally committed to the small ruling bourgeoisie that wants to suck all of the wealth out of the world and leave the rest of us to starve on the streets. I mean, you have to make a choice. When you look at something that happened in Bolivia, you have to make a choice. Where do you want to stand? Do you want to stand with the hyperventilating liberalism of the New York Times, which is perfectly happy to see people starve on the streets of the United States, hasn't made hunger in the United States an issue? Or are you going to stand with people like Evo Morales? There's no choice here, friends. I mean, we're at a point in world history where you really have to pick a stand. Are you going to stand with the movements in Bolivia that were trying to bring justice to the people? Or are you going to stand with the military, with the fascists of that Santa Cruz committee? You're going to stand with the RSS in India? Are you going to stand with people like that? That's the choice you have. I've made my choice. You know, I might sound to you like I'm just a little unnuanced for the 21st century. And let me tell you something, the 21st century doesn't give us the opportunity to be altogether nuanced. Thanks a lot. Hello, um, thank you so much. Um, so much passion for a Thursday night. Um, did you also want to talk a bit more about your book? Because you talked about other things. I'm just going to, you've got a few minutes. So I just want to give you the chance to do that. Are you asking me to talk yeah, a little bit more about my book? Um, yeah, or just, or just <laughs> always, yeah, yeah, just give you a second. Well, actually, I told you everything about my book, but I didn't talk about the book. It's every oh. single theme in the book. Because the book is about coups. It's about, let me just say one thing, though. Um, one of the reasons I like Vincent's book so much is that Vincent goes into an era which is, as he says, has been by deliberate amnesia forgotten. What was done to the left and less left sympathizers, and Vincent, I'm just going to take Indonesia, because I know the book has got Brazil in a big way, but let's just take Indonesia. What was done to the very brave and sensitive people of the Communist Party of Indonesia and their sympathizers, what was done to them is so grotesque. It's so grotesque. You know, when I say the word gulag, people have an entire understanding of, you know, what they think they know happened in the USSR. But if I say the beaches of Bali, they're going to think about, you know, holidays, you know, drinks, music, like hideous music from Ibiza playing in the beaches of Bali. But underneath the sand, Yara, underneath the sand, not very far down, is the blood of tens of thousands of people in Bali who were slaughtered on those very beaches. Every tourist that walks on that beach should know that on those very beaches, there were people slaughtered. And if you have a chance, you must see the film called, and Vincent, please remind me, it's called The uh, Act of Killing. The Act, of mm. Killing. Act of Killing. You must see the film Act of Killing. Because in the way, the act of killing was the movie that came out first, and then Vincent wrote the book afterwards. And what I've done is to go a little further. I've done the history, in a sense, of American imperialism from 1776 all the way to today. So it's, it's a, it goes ahead to today, but it goes back to 1776. Um, sounds wonderful. Um, OK, so we're going to do questions now. Um, and uh, yeah, before we do, I just wanted to say that um, it, what you were both saying really struck a chord with me. I remember um, growing up and hearing like stories of the Brazilian dictatorship from my mum and then going into school in South London 
and we had this textbook that would talk about the Cold War. And I remember putting my hand up and saying, like, I think there's bits that are missing. And even the teacher looking at me and being like, what are you talking about? Um, and just how this classroom full of migrant kids was actually really divorced from where their parents had come from and why they had come. Um, so, yeah, thanks for uh, writing that history back up for us and talking about it. Um, OK, so the first question is from Robert. Uh, Donahue. Um, I think it's going to come up on the screen as well. Um, do socialists in the North, the global North, too narrowly conceive of anti-capitalist politics in exclusively European terms and overlook the success of socialist projects in South America? How do we change that? So that's something you both touched on and talked about. Vincent, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Um... Yes, I think I think um, and it's not just uh, at the level of left politics in Europe versus the left politics in the global south. I think we and um, I hold myself and a lot of the publications I write for accountable for this, too, um, are just very narrowly myopic in terms of political horizons in the in sort of NATO, uh, the West, uh, United States and Western Europe. Um, there is, I think, far too often the automatic assumption that we are the global subject of history, whether, you know, the idea that uh, the future of global politics will come from Brooklyn or sort of Islington seems sort of uh, deeply uh, uh, sort of ingrained into maybe the Anglophone consciousness. And I think that's that's probably something we should fight back against. Um, uh, there is the vast majority of the world's peoples uh, are not in the first world, they're in the third world. Um, it's very possible that this is really where history uh, is being made and will be made. Um, so uh, how to how do we change that? I think, you know, just I think a little bit of humility and read widely and, and recognize if you can pick up a book like mine or Vijay's and recognize that the, the very chair that I sit on here in East London and, and, and the, the circumstances that led to almost all of the material comforts that um, the middle and upper classes in the first world enjoy came from a history of violent suppression. Um, and colonialism, neo-colonialism, and, and just try to think as widely as possible about where you fit into that global system, um, sort of like act, you know, think globally and act globally, like really, you know, we uh, try to be um, as cognizant of your particular, uh, particular outlet, and what is this, uh, of your, of, of the particular nature of your, of your subjectivity, rather than to assume that you're at the forefront, just because you're in a rich country where that makes all the movies and the music. Yeah. Every day. Oh, you're muted. Sorry yeah. about that. Uh, I just don't want you to hear me breathing in the mic inappropriately. Yeah. <laughs> so, the first thing I would like to say is that you know, some Italian communists went to visit Ho Chi Minh in Hanoi during the U.S. war on Vietnam. And they asked Ho Chi Minh, you know, what shall we do? And Ho Chi Minh, you know, is an unflappably polite and lovely man. I mean, obviously, I was two years old when he died, so I don't know him, but I'm writing a book about him. So I have feel like I've digested everything about his personality. Not true, but I'm, I want to try. Um, they asked him, you know, what should, what can we do, uh, comrade, and so on. And Ho Chi Minh said, go back home and make a revolution. And I, that is the advice I give people. What can I do in my country? What can I, well, for God's sake, you're in the United Kingdom. Jeremy Corbyn, a perfectly decent man, you allowed him to be hounded out of the Labour Party. I mean, why weren't millions of people in Britain standing up against the bullshit campaign that hounded Jeremy Corbyn, you know, with a team that included such fine and sensitive people like Diane Abbott, John McDonald, people I highly respect. You know, you had a chance in Britain. Imagine if Jeremy was the prime minister instead of this buffoon Boris Johnson that you have. It would have been a different situation, I think, partly. It could have changed some of the balance of forces. Uh, it would have been so interesting. Go home and make a revolution, friends. And while you're at it, Please join the campaign to make sure that the Cuban medical workers win the Nobel Prize. That would be amazing if 200,000 people in the United Kingdom, God knows what kingdom it is and how united it is, but that's the name you've chosen. 
If 200, 300,000 people in the United Kingdom signed the petition demanding that the people in Oslo, wherever the hell they are, award the only viable candidate for the Nobel Prize during this pandemic, if they come and stand behind the Cuban doctors and the Cuban doctors win the Nobel Prize, the world will sigh with relief just for a minute. When that first news is broadcast, Yara, just for a very brief minute, the people of the world will sigh. It will be such a deep sigh that the carbon around us will quiver. And just for that, I am begging you, please help us organize the Nobel Peace Prize. But otherwise, it's a very simple task. Go home, make your revolution. Um, yeah, thank you for that very clear message, um, BJ. Okay, I'm going to go to um, the next question. Um, is it from Troop Sandu? And it's for Vincent. I know, oh, this is a nice one. This is a, um, I, know, it's, I know it's really soon after the Jakarta method has been released, but what do you, do you have any plans on what you're going to write next? Yeah. Well, that's really nice. Uh, um, yes, I'm, I'm trying to work on something. I can't say too much because I'm still trying to make sure that it happens again. But um, I do. I do want to do. Um, let me. What I'll say is that I think that um, over the last from 10, 2010 to 2020, we um, around the world there was a lot of um, mass protests that um, in Brazil is one that you know you already know the case of what happened in 2013 and how that led to Bolsonaro in the long term. Um, there was a lot of mass protests, uh, often leaderless, uh, spontaneous mass protests was the way that was supposed to go, supposed to be spurred on by so social media. A lot of they didn't work out uh, the way uh, that they wanted to or that um, the global liberal, liberal narrative sort of um, insisted that they should. So I'm looking at that and uh, hopefully uh, I'll get a chance to look at it a lot more closely. Can't wait. Um Charlie Rainbird, I'm skipping your question because I think Vijay and Vincent have already covered it. Um, and I'm going to uh, Mitali Bassin's question. Um, this is for Vijay. Um, would love to know Vijay's thoughts on the anti-CAA protests that took place in India recently. In a lot of ways, the protests were not just, not just against fascism, but by extension against capitalism too. Well, um, Mitali, it's a great question. And as it happens today um, at New Labour Forum, my comrade and colleague Satarupa Chakravati and I have an essay called The Wretchedness of the Indian Ruling Class, in which we go into the anti-CAA protests. We look at particularly Delhi, where, as you may know, uh, there was, of course, the Shaheen Bagh occupation. And then there was the pogrom against Muslims in um, mainly northeastern Delhi. Uh, areas like Silampur, which I know very well because I was a young reporter there now in the early 1990s. And I wrote a book uh, called Untouchable Freedom, which was about a Dalit community. And I did a lot of field work in Silampur. There was a pogrom against Muslims in Silampur. You may have seen recently, and this tells you a little bit about liberals and also about British publishing, that a British publisher called Bloomsbury uh, was going to release a book called Delhi Riots. Uh, which is a total Hindu right-wing propaganda book uh, about those riots, saying that they were started by Muslims and so on. The person who was going to launch the book in India is a right-wing zealot who helped fan the flames of that uh, pogrom. This is Bloomsbury, mark you. This is not uh, you know, some right-wing press. Uh, I think, I'm not sure, Bloomsbury, by my calculations, this is the neighborhood in London where Virginia Woolf and so on used to live. And by my calculation, this is supposed to be a quite a, you know, considerably upper class type press, right? This is not some bottom feeder press. This is some top level cultural press. Well, so much for them, you know, honestly, because they basically published a book, which is, this is like publishing Hitler's autobiography in 1921. Um, this is exactly what Bloomsbury did. They pulled it. But by the way, on their, on their list, they also have the autobiography of the Indian Home Minister, Amit Shah, which is a total disgrace. And I can't believe they published it, even in the interest of public you know, information. Because there is that argument that you should publish the world leaders' 
for the sake of public information and so on. Um, but my God, in, you published that and then you did this. So yes, of course, the anti-CAA protest is not just about you know liberal democracy. It wasn't merely about Muslim rights and the idea of Indian citizenship. It was entirely an anti-fascist uh, development. And certainly, if it's an anti-fascist development, remember that old slogan: if you're uh, if you're not against capitalism, we used to say you can't be against fascism. And so, if you're if it's an anti-fascist, genuinely anti-fascist movement. It's going to have an anti-capitalist dimension, which it did have. But it was really, uh, if you were in India, if you're writing from India, I don't know Mitali, but I, I walked through every single one of the protests in Calcutta, Delhi, and so on. These were such joyous demonstrations with song, with poetry, with hum dekhenge, you know, we will see, I mean, just bold and tough poetry and, and loving. Uh, you know, Amir Aziz read out a beautiful poem at a protest and I, it was such a great moment of fortune. I had sent it to Roger Waters and in London at a protest um, for Julian Assange, Roger read out Amir Aziz's anti-CAA protest. Uh, it was so beautiful. You can't imagine this young Indian poet was so happy that his childhood idol from Pink Floyd, Roger Waters, read out his poem at a demonstration for Julian Assange. Thank you. Um, okay, I've got a question here from Alex Brent. Um, we need solutions outside of electoral politics, aside from the mass strike. What other tools do left movements have in resisting capital um, imperialism abroad? Vijay, you want to start off on this one? I mean, it depends on what you mean by politics. That's the main thing. Um, I, I would like to say that the understanding that we have from over a hundred years of building left struggles and left theory, um, the principal objective of left politics prior to coming to power is to build the confidence of the working class, of the peasantry, of, of the masses. You know, one of the things capitalism does as a sociological force is it atomizes people, it erodes our confidence that we can have power in the world. You know, the sensibility, a sensibility develops that you must go, you must vote, you know, and then four or five years later, depending on the cycle, you can come back and do it. But in the interim, you're sort of powerless. You become a consumer of news. You know, you watch the politicians argue amongst each other. You don't really have a role. So democracy is, is, is something that ironically, the way it's constructed in terms of its its um, its manipulation of power, it it makes you feel in a sense apolitical or even anti-political. You get cynical and, and depressed. And the role of the left, apart from you know trying to develop the understanding of the system and so on, is to build people's confidence. And that is why ceaseless participation in struggles. You, you remember, guys, when you first went to a demonstration. Somebody said there's a demonstration. I don't know if you're in London, it's, you know, wherever in front of X, Y, Z place. And you were so scared to go because you thought people will judge you badly. You know, it's like you're in middle school again. You are walking into the cafeteria with a tray alone. You're scared to go there. You don't know, will I get beaten, arrested? Maybe your parents are not political people, so they don't advise you to go. And you feel a lot of negative pressure. But then you go and you realize, wow, these are lovely people and, you know, people are not mean and people are welcoming. And then you go again and your confidence gets raised. And then you're confident to tell somebody when they say something outrageous, listen, that's out of line. That's a sexist thing. You can't talk like that. But look at the amount of confidence, the praxis it took for you to be able to tell somebody on the tube. You can't do, you can't touch somebody like that. That's outrageous. You know, that, I don't accept it. Earlier, you might have seen that and got scared. Politics is about building confidence. So these questions of electoral politics, mass strike, these things are all for later. You know, you've reached a stage, we've reached a stage globally where we've forgotten the essence of political action, which is to make people feel subjects of history. You know, after that, we can have the subjects of history have debates and discussions. Should we go on strike now? Should we do this? Should we do that? You can't predetermine you know, the, the program of action before you have mass struggles of confident people. So when I look at Brazil, 
And I see like the MST building, you know, encampments and settlements and seeing ordinary people. I've spent a lot of time in those settlements because we have an office in Sao Paulo. We have incredible comrades working there. When you see ordinary working class people develop immense confidence to come in, to speak their minds, let the process determine the forms of action. Don't have a debate about the forms of action before you've created confident people in a process that can have that conversation. Yeah, that's great. And I might, I might uh, I'll offer an addition to sort of more limited and um, an easier sort of an obviously, you know, the obvious journalist answer is that if you're a citizen in the US or the UK um, and uh, you want to resist imperialism, um, it, you know, as Vijay said, uh, you get an opportunity to vote every four years, but in, in that entire time between all those elections, what you can do is insist upon a full and transparent account of what your government is really doing, right? So insist upon the truth about history and insist upon truth about what is happening right now, um, because far too much of what has been done in our name and in uh, the United States and Western Europe has happened because people have been have allowed for this, uh, what was the phrase which I used, the intentionally, intentionally imposed amnesia, right? Amnesia about the past, but also amnesia about what's happened, you know, three months ago, nine months ago, 18 months ago. So um, you have a responsibility to limit damage done by your own government. So um, uh, in, in the long term, uh, uh, rather, you know, if the goal may be empowering the working class or the peasantry, three, but in the, in the, I think you also can just insist upon the truth um, and, and, be very loud when people are lying to you, you know, don't, don't allow that to happen and, um, and insist upon transparency. Thank you. Um, we've got two minutes left. So I'm going to squish two questions into one and ask you both to answer in like 30 seconds. <laughs> if you think that's possible. Sure. Um, but in the spirit of um, helping everyone who is on this stream like feel like a subject of history um which i think is a really beautiful way of putting it um do you think um so natalie pearl has asked do you think trump's us is weaker now than in the past or not and this is a very speculative question but like is there a way that US Latin American relations could have gone differently at some point in history? So I guess basically I just want you to answer with some sense of like, yes, there is a way that history can off. <laughs> so the, yeah, I think the first question, the answer is pretty simple. I think that the United States is in relative decline. It's still the most powerful military and economic force um, on the planet, but it is less powerful than it used to be. I think that is a trend that will continue and this opens up all kinds of possibilities for a reconfiguration of global politics. Who knows if that means things could get way better, it could mean what they get worse also, but I think that the decline of the US relative to its previous power does open up possibilities and it puts us at a, uh, a very contingent and um, uh, uh, interesting juncture in world history. Uh, and yes, absolutely, I think that the United States did not need to become what it um, and eventually became. A lot of the people that I spoke to, you know, Ho Chi Minh is a great example of when he declared independence from uh, France in 1945. He dedicated the Declaration of Independence to the American Declaration of Independence, not only sort of because he didn't want America to attack him, but because um, peoples from around the world had been inspired by the, the revolutionary history uh, within the U.S. Um, mm. But I think that the sort of slave-holding settler colonial History, the other sort of darker demon in our past was the one that emerged, and I didn't think it. Ha I don't think it had to be that way. Okay, we could VJ go. Well, this is the second event, Yara, that I've done with Vincent, and I would like to do a third event where we can pick up on the question of: Is the United States necessarily the most dangerous force in the world? Um, Vincent, that would be a great forum. And I think it's unfair in 30 seconds to even attempt an answer. But I enjoy, I really enjoyed uh, chatting with you the last time and this time. I, I highly recommend Jakarta Method. I think people should read it. Um, you know, Yara, I think that what I'm going to just say in 10 seconds is that, you know, we have a lot of work to do. And I just want to say that, you know, these are difficult times. Um, as I said, it's the birthday of my friend, uh, Eduardo Galliano. And I want to say that one of the things I learned from Eduardo is that you just need to love one another. And you've got to really take care of each other. You've got to be less harsh with each other when we think about these difficult issues. Um, that doesn't mean that we're not going to draw strong lines against the enemy. 
and there is an enemy. I mean, I'm not saying go and hug everybody, but from the standpoint of the left, I just want to say there is a kind of tendency that develops of tearing each other apart. And these are difficult issues. I agree with Vincent that the United States is a, is a, is a place in decline. It's a territory in decline. But it's not going to go down easily because, as he said, it's got a terribly dangerous military and it can destroy China. And I want people to go to a website called NoColdWar.org. It's a no cold war between the United States and China. Please go sign the statement. Thank you. And um, I've got a few comments I need to make to wrap up. Um, but before I do, I want to say thank you both so much. Um, I know I really enjoyed that discussion. And what, yeah, what a pleasure to be um, like virtually sat between you both. Um, <laughs> and thank you everyone who asked questions and how exciting that there were so many questions we couldn't even answer them all. Um, so yeah, what a joy to have been here with you both. Thank you. Um, so to continue the discussions, we have set up a dedicated space on our community forum. Um, so if you've got a World, uh, World Transformed account, then you can log on, but it also the instructions and stuff will be in the chat. Um, and also register for other events. So there are lots of other um, World Transformed 2020 events. They're filling up very quickly, so make sure that you've registered um, and make sure you've registered for the festival at theworldtransformed.org forward slash register um, and then go and book the individual events that you want. And uh, I'm just going to plug it again. Please consider donating. It's theworldtransformed.org forward slash support. Um, and Vijay's book is Washington Bullets and Vincent's is the Jakarta Method. Um, and then lastly, before we go, I just wanted, we just wanted to say a big um, rest in power to uh, David Graeber, who passed away um, at 58 very recently. And um, I know that my timeline was just full of things from people that learned so much from him and also organized with him. Um, so yeah, I just want to take the space to remember him. View the full TWT20 program and become a supporter today to help us deliver political education all year round at theworldtransformed.org.